you have the information that you have and the more the merrier but um, you also have to digest it of course uh, and, and see uh, um, uh, go through the to the uh, to the system as well um, once you get it in and once you notice that there are discrepancies or so uh, uh, on certain uh, data or we don't understand it then we need to have a dialogue of uh, why are these figures like this and I think what we see sometimes uh, uh, ballast systems uh, they are common or certain more detailed uh, items uh, once you get on, on board basically and, and get really an understanding and I think that's a but it's a very good point um, solve for you come on board never seen the vessel before basically but the crew of course is expert uh, on the vessel uh, if they are uh, not too shocked uh, because it depends a little bit on the situation that, uh, that you're in but if the crew is uh, not overstressed basically, and then uh, a chief engineer is on board and a uh, master first officer, they can guide the way through the engine room, through uh, how the ballast uh, system works, and all those kind of things. And a solve for we, from a uh, uh, helicopter view, we know what we need to look at, do, but you then start drilling down. So, as an initial response, I think the information is quite similar. Uh, let me just uh, I was just trying to think the initial response mainly being, do you know any flooding? What are the drafts of ground? Yeah. Um, discharge of cargo, not discharge of cargo. That basic <coughs> information. Beyond that, the only maybe additional information would be bottom type, if we know bottom type. I'm not sure if that's given to your damage stability provider. Um, the other consideration that the damage stability provider may not consider is where exactly are you or ground? Meaning are you ground on a reef? In a sheltered area in a small bay where it's hard to get a tug into, or you ground somewhere on a reef outside where it's very easy to get a tug to. Those are the kinds of considerations and salvers that we might be starting to take into consideration operationally. How do we approach the vessel? Um, how do we get equipment on board? Can is it possible to bring a vessel alongside? Is there is the vessel geared so we can move cargo up? Is the vessel still operational? Meaning you have a power plant running, engine room generators. I'm not sure all that information goes to damage stability, but that information is helpful to us for us to start formulating in our mind how we would respond. Yeah, I think that that is uh, it's very true. So we would like to have that information accurate, factual, um, and uh, so we are your contractor. So we are standing next to you to, to deal with it. Sometimes uh, it takes a bit of time to build up a relationship in, in a, such a stressful situation. In some cases we go on board where we don't really have a relationship with the owners, so only due to the incident we get involved and, and, and go there. And of course, um, Solvor is a commercial contractor. So um, it might happen that a uh, kind of ballast situation is a little bit uh, iffy. Uh, certain ballast systems uh, are due for maintenance or whatever, and uh, it's not operating well. We need to know this. Maybe otherwise we might uh, break into some systems and it doesn't work uh, and we lose a day or two uh, by figuring it out ourselves and uh, we will not disclose this we're not uh, for the causation we don't know why it happened that uh, maybe a navigational error was made or that you deviated in, uh, to, to prevent the collision uh, or uh, some flooding happened on board uh, frankly we don't care why it happened, it did happen. Now we need to find a, a, a way out of it. So that's our position. But from an owner's position and from a master and, and, and a crew on board, uh, they can be a little bit guarded, of course. Say, well, why do we share this uh, information with these, uh, these guys that we do not know? Um, and that's where we sometimes see a little bit of, uh, of tension. Uh, and, and we need to try to say uh, break through that uh, so that we are all on the same page. Uh, another case here of Singapore. Well, we, huh? And that's why it's also good to get on board yeah. to yourself as an assessment is some of the information the crew may be withholding or not withholding but limiting the information. I wouldn't necessarily want to say lying mm -hmm. or misleading but there is a possibility 
very minor possibility of some of that occurring. <laughs> yeah. So you want to verify and check that. And then also being able to talk to the master to discuss the situation and have authenticated the ballasting system, whether the ballast system was oper operable or not operable. But there's other instances where the salvage master just gets on board and starts walking around. As he walks around, he sees, I can't think of a specific example at the moment, but he sees something like, oh, I could use that. And I wouldn't need to bring a crane barge. I can use a small little dab of crane here, take the lifeboat off, for instance, and I can swing a small power pack up, maybe as an example. So to get on board and just walk around to start seeing the situation, he can start building a better picture in his head. And that kind of information you don't get in a one-page email with your draft, your displacement, your cargo. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of information that really makes it beneficial to us to visit the vessel. No, that, that is correct. And, but I think we normally go there, and uh, even though the crew has done soundings, we would do soundings as well, uh, just to verify, uh, to see that, uh, that we're saying the same thing. And it will be done uh, during uh, several uh, timings of the day. Uh, uh, the situation can deteriorate as well. But uh, an example of uh, sometimes where the trust is not really there uh, was involved with the case here in Singapore. It was a collision, and uh, we get a call. Sometimes salvage can engage direct because we have an agreement basically in place for the states. Anywhere else in the world, basically where we know each other, but we don't have an, a firm agreement uh, in place. So you get a salvage contractor first uh, involved. And in this case, we were uh, you might engage a salvage broker or a, a correspondent. So we were called up via a correspondent via this is special at a collision, uh, do you have a few divers in a pump? Sure. And uh, a few divers in a pump so that uh, you do on a day rate or something, uh, no problem. So uh, the second call was from the consultant. He said, uh, yeah, we're going to put this vessel on the ground because uh, we're sinking. So, well, mm, a few divers in a pump would not uh, prevent a, sink, uh, a vessel from, from sinking, basically. And turn out this vessel had like a uh, damage of five by four meters in the side. So with, with uh, uh, 20 divers and, and 50 pumps, you would not do anything uh, to, uh, to uh, mitigate uh, flooding, flooding hold, of course. And um, uh, then you talk a completely different situation, but basically it, it's down to uh, uh, being comfortable with sharing um, a situation that is can be uh, yeah, sensitive, uh, basically, and with, with an external party. Uh, you, nobody likes to hang out with dirty laundry, but uh, yeah, you need to... That's a good point. It's, yeah. We don't care how it happened. If it happened, we just need to know about it so we can alleviate the problem. Right. If I it think, was a mis... I think the problem you have here is when this first happened, almost inevitably the ship understates what's happened. Yeah. It's always a couple of scratches in the paint, which means they've pushed the forecastle back three meters, or <laughs> yeah. and has a great big gash in the side, or, yeah. or touch the bottom, which means she's uh, hard aground. Yeah. <laughs> Bow in the air like like this, but that's yeah. That, that's I don't think that's really that that happened. I've never come across any of the incidences we've been involved in where where the captain has called up and given us an accurate. Picture. It's yeah. always they're always optimists that there's yeah. a few scratches in the paint or uh, touch the bottom. It's never we ran we, we <laughs> never ran hard aground and yeah. uh, no, 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 no chance yeah. of coming off in the months or something. Yeah, but and but that is that is uh, that is uh, and, and that's internally say basically. But if you uh, would then ask the same people to address it to an uh, external party, basically everything is under control. <laughs> there's absolutely not uh, going on. Um, sometimes, uh, if we hear of a uh, situation, uh, I would be able to maybe get uh, on the internet, find uh, the the the, the Imarsat number of your vessel, and I will call the master. Um, maybe I'm, I'm not the case uh, on, on that particular vessel, but I will call the master, or or uh, somebody picks up. Uh, in that case, they might think I'm the authority, and. Um, if I hear that they are uh, concerned or panicky on board, I say, well, okay, then I think that, that there's something going on uh, at the moment. If I hear a uh, uh, full, calm, and collected uh, kind of response, 
and there's like uh, an indication of what, what's going on. So okay, that's a bit more stable, and you, you get a, a bit of a feel for what's going on. But um, yeah, it is down. It comes down to communication, and uh, the, provided the information that you get, yeah, because later on you say, well, you responded for this, and there's a, a few pain scratches basically. Uh, but it turns out that it's, it's much more severe. And if you would have told me in the beginning, I could have bring in the cavalry immediately, uh, give it a big uh, knock, and then uh, uh, basically we would be okay now. Now we basically are in a situation that we would escalate. So at least uh, for, for your, uh, your side, it's very important that you uh, yeah, probe very, very hard to understand uh, what, what, what you're dealing with. Yeah, no, no, no. I, you, you have to there'll be a few scratches in the find, and then you <laughs> say, it's just scratches in the find, they'll say, oh, and a couple of bent rails. <laughs> 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 no, 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 but, but it is, you, you know, if you hear that from uh, one uh, master and you hear it from another master, it, it has a different uh, meaning, right? So, uh, Cody, uh, as a naval actor, well, everything's under control. So we know everything's under control. Uh, but maybe an, another naval actor said, well, a little bit concerned about this, that, that so everything is under control basically. So it, every individual is different uh, to that extent, and yeah, you need to have uh, a relationship and an, an understanding about that. I think uh, so, but uh, the, the, those are not uh, factual and accurate. Uh, but that is uh, what you would strive for. Uh, let me put it that way. Drafts, being able to record the drafts of the vessel um, may not always be easy from on board the vessel itself. You may have to do it externally. It's good to be able to try to monitor the drafts, especially a ground over a time period, keep a log. That way you know if she's buoyant and responding in certain areas or if she's hard to ground and she isn't shifting, isn't moving. But always fore, aft, port, starboard, midships, minimum of at least six. If possible, if you can't, do it from the outside, you can't read the draft marks, even freeboard readings. If you can take a sounding tape, lean over the side, all that information, start creating a log, helps. Internal soundings, you have the uh, one log report in your handout pre and post. It'd be good when you are aground to be able to continue to do, um, I don't know, two to three hour or four hour continually logs of the soundings because you never know as swells, weather builds up, if you have a plate that is weak that end up getting it excuse me, that gives away, and then you have flooding, aggressive flooding. External soundings, same as you've seen, mode line survey from around the perimeter of the vessel, just to get an idea of where you're actually aground at, whether you're ground forward, ground midships, port, starboard, try to get a better picture. Um, as you can see in the handout, we're, I think, 8.6 meters on the starboard midship, so that's our indication that we're aground starboard side. As I said, keep a log, try to be um, consistent with your timing and just uh, accurate with your numbers. Right, wrong, or indifference as long as, I mean, not wrong, but the numbers are the numbers. Just keep a log of it and it helps paint a picture of what's going on. If you can see the damage description, you got a tear on the side of the hull and you can get an idea it's pretty, um, torn between frame 53 to 65 and way of ballast tank 4 from one meter above waterline or down to waterline, can't tell depth to above. All that information, not necessarily from, from a salvage case, it's good to know, from a salvage standpoint, it's good to know for if we can patch it, how do we patch it, what equipment do we need to start looking from, I guess, the vessel side and the owner side, the same thing for the damage is to know the extent of the damage. The other thing that's good from the salvage case is the longitudinal strength restrictions. How severely damaged is the hull structure? Location and drift. Obviously, you're not drifting if you're aground. Drifting is more for engine failure or collisions. But being able to monitor your position accurately, whether that's with the vessel's GPS or handheld portable GPS. Sometimes in uh, grounding cases, we'll end up 
for salvers. We'll bring a portable GPS, put one up on the bow, one on the stern, and just see if the vessel's actually shifting a little bit, changing heading, and that gives us an indication of possibly how far back the ground point is or how lively the vessel may be. Weather, weather is always important. Obviously, a vessel aground is a, it's a time consideration. If you're living uh, in an exposed situation, for example, the Rena, Rena was aground, somewhat stable, and then she had a weather that built up, uh, yeah. progressively rolled, and then the weather seas built up even further, which exacerbated her strength, eventually breaking in two. Same vessel, same aground in a sheltered bay, could probably sit there indefinitely until she was lighter and pulled away to safety. So it's good to watch the weather reports and try to see what the forecast is coming down the line. And knowing if you have time to wait for that lighter <coughs> vessel, or if you don't. Um, same thing as Boss was kind of talking about earlier between communication between the master and salvers. It's just that communication of information, trying to be on the same page, not trying to cast blame but we just need to have the information so we can respond. We're not there to make your life worse, we're there to try to save the vessel and make your life better. Boss, I don't know if you want to touch on this at all, but I think we've yeah, talked about this pretty good. But just your normal procedures that you guys have already gone through, contacting P&I, media, et cetera. Once again, taking control of the situation, Salvers propose a ballasting air, down, air blow down procedure proposal. Now, let me pick up on this right after lunch and we'll start there. So if you guys wanna go ahead and break for lunch, we can go ahead and break for lunch. Does that work? Yep, we can uh, discuss for after lunch. And effectively refloat without having to remove any cargo. Now this is different than all three of your proposals, every one of you said lighter right off the bat. Out of curiosity, did, <coughs> did you guys consider trying to ballast or trying to pull? And just why, why did you go for lighter and why immediately make that step? We had discussed this uh, putting air into the tanks. Because okay. previously, we, in my last company, we had uh, done something similar. Okay. And uh, because the quantity was less uh, comparatively uh, here, uh, 7,500 tons we are looking at, and uh, maybe that was the reason we okay. went for light rain. So this is what the salvers had proposed doing, what they attempted. What they found is from the theoretical calculations, you could counterbalance the port tanks that were still intact and use an air deballasting or air blowdown as you've just described to recover a portion of the buoyancy in the four starboard tanks. Could you the reason we, we at the table thought about uh, lightning is very simple. I mean, there's no way the vessel's going to do the voyage. Absolutely okay. no way the vessel is going to do the voyage. You have to get it out. To do repairs, you have to get rid of the cargo. So if you can get a vessel off and safely lighter off the cargo, the other vessel can perform the voyage for you. You're rid of that obligation. The charter and the commercial needs are also taken care of. <coughs> well, it helps you being safe too, because mm -hmm. by then you've you've got you've got rid of the highest risk in today's <coughs> like what we are talking with uh, bass in the afternoon at lunch. It's, Unluckily, although containers seem to trend as the one which has the maximum requirement of salvage and uh, accidents and incidents, it's the tankers that come in the limelight because of the commercial and the pollution aspect. Yeah. So once you've removed the pollutant from the vessel, you've taken care of that worry mainly. You, you put it on and, and then you can work at peace and not worrying of things going southward there onwards. Okay. So, I mean, for it depends on owner to owner on their thought process, but I suppose in what line and the thing is, get rid of the cargo, let's not have anything to do which would make the situation into a higher risk at a later stage. Well, I completely understand that point of view, and it probably if that was the case, we wouldn't even 
attempted this method here. This is just the GHS output for this building calculations <coughs> showing how you can I mean, load the vessel to achieve. In the couple which you've had in the fleet and which I've known with uh, these owners, is they're very clear. You, you don't expose yourself to that kind of risk. You, you, have an, you have an issue with cargo, you get the cargo off the vessel, and that's what we've always done for a couple of incidents which we've had. The cargo comes off the vessel at the, okay. at, at the first opportunity. Even if it's not breached, intact, get the cargo off, get it off, and then, then we take it up later, because uh, the risk is just, just too, too high in today's uh, trade. But uh, won't it be difficult to light up full cargo which is alongside when she is not stable. If she is hard at ground, she is not moving, it, yeah. it is one thing. But if she is lively and you bring another vessel to take off of similar uh, size to take off the cargo mm -hmm. and to maintain both the vessels at the same spot because the, uh, the tide, everything is changing. Mm -hmm. And to maintain her in that position, won't it be difficult? Well, we are looking at 24 hours at least. Yeah. Now you said lightly as a consideration. If it is lightly and there's a potential that it's already moving and shifting, yeah. you're either a doing more damage, or b she's coming off. So if you're at that borderline where she's already got a fair amount of movement, maybe you make the pull attempt. Yeah. Or if you are afraid of that you are a full, fully laden vessel, most likely you still have ballast capacity. You load her down. You look at your stability model, we're gonna just double check, make sure you're not gonna overstress anything, and to take ballast and you set her hard to ground. Which is actually something that we suggest a lot of times when we have a vessel initially grounded and there's inclement weather oncoming, tugs are five days out, but weather's three days out, you wanna prevent the situation from getting worse, you wanna weigh the vessel down as much as possible and keep her from wanting to move and be as lively as possible until you have the assets on site but to affect a reflow. In this case, the it's sitting on a rock. Yes. And to take more ballast, I don't think so that is an option. Because you, you need to... You increase your, bed, increase your bending moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so what do you suggest? Uh, and she will be moving. Uh, in uh, uh, this uh, place, she will be moving. Uh, do you think she'll not move in, uh, in this situation? I At was, I was presuming that she wouldn't have moved, or she wouldn't be rocking heavy. Rocking, yeah. Maybe she trims a little bit with the tide, but I wouldn't think necessarily it's a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a quickly dynamic situation. I think maybe more like a steady, gradual, but when you are ever lightly, so slow, that is when she is in present condition, correct? Mm -hmm. But when you start light rain, yes, that time she will move. Or uh, for twenty four hours, we are talking about. If you're able to pump off in twenty four hours, you have what two tide cycles. So at least she's going to start getting lively at some point, depending upon when you start the pumping. Second tide, I would in that situation actually counter ballast. Yeah. Yeah. So as you pump the fuel off, you put the water, <coughs> you put the water back into your ballast tank. So you, you keep her ground, get the oil off, and then you pump the water out on your intact tank. Mm -hmm. So then you have the lighter and the things off. And but then you, you don't have uh, that much ballast capacity in uh, yeah, the left. Hmm? Like, the one which I said where we had the grounded bulk carrier off, and then it, was, it was a very low profile case because, like, but she was quite a bit off. But the thing is, once we started lightering her, and that was about once we started getting uh, off, that she came off, and then you could come when you came off, you initially put water, and then you when she came off, she came off quite easily, and then you mm -hmm. could hold her back. I mean, so it just to reduce, I mean, if it was oil or whatever, it is, it's just reduces that amount of risk you're exposing yourself. Even if you take quantifying, if you're talking about 10 barrels of oil which are there on board, if you've lighted just five, you will cause only five barrels of pollution <laughs> compared to where you could actually end up in a much worse situation of being 
going down with the full 10 barrels. But, but it's, I think, uh, it's a good discussion, of course, to have. Uh, but there are, of course, in the areas where you indeed have limited ballast possibilities. Yeah, 30% only. Uh, so, so here, I think indeed, you put it uh, on cargo tanks. You, you might find yourself a little bit in, an, uh, in, in the scenario that... Uh, and, and I don't think here. in that situation it would be easier to lighter, uh, as we said, 7,500. And not to and, complete lighter. And not to do complete and move her off and then uh, yeah. get her uh, yeah. complete. Because within 24 hours uh, or 30 hours of exposure time, you will be able to achieve the same result which you are trying to achieve in 24 hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but but I, the only thing yeah, I would say, sorry. even if you do a partial lightering, 7,000 ton, 10,000 ton, etc., I would still counter ballast while you're doing that. Because Once you complete the lightering, get her out of the, get your lightering vessel out of the way, remove your hose uh, That's why we said we will take measures to hold her in position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we have uh, 7,500 to mm -hmm. uh, counter ballast with 7,500 of ballast is easier. Yeah. Correct. No. But uh, to counterbalance 40,000 tons of cargo with ballast is difficult. Yes. I, I think it's prudent uh, to have uh, a tux in position anyway um, in this kind of uh, situation where, yeah, we all see the figures and uh, we know what we have, uh, but nobody can really look underneath. Okay. Uh, so see how it is. And she might pivot a little bit, and if you look at the scenario, that might be the case. So at least maybe some heading control, and let's say there is a uh, freak surge or a uh, uh, Sumatra uh, squall coming in uh, through here, and you get a little bit of uh, elevation from uh, wave action or something, uh, because that, uh, that could happen as well, uh, and you have an opportunity to, uh, to see then you can control her. And if you don't have any tugs at that point in time, well, you're <laughs> in quite a different Should situation. And possibly further yeah. around? Or yeah, if you put this in the context of OPA 90, you're never going to be able to make these decisions without the captain of the port and the Coast Guard guys agreeing with your action plan in advance, which to me is going to mean you're going to have those tugs there, at least on that side. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. No, there's a, there's a full-fledged salvage plan that would, is generated by the salvers and goes through up through the board, captain of the port, um, all the relevant authorities, everyone signs off on it before they even give you the approval to proceed. And then you can throw it all away and then uh, see what the actual situation is, basically. And then you have to anticipate uh, on, on certain of these things. But I think, uh, like contingency for the Turks and so on, uh, those will be in place. And, and uh, yeah, I think that is uh, part of the solid plan to have contingencies. That's good to both of you. Just one doubt when it comes to this. Something that I yeah. have to ask in the morning, but I, I missed out. When you run aground, I mean, you don't know your damage. There are times when you think about letting go anchor, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When do you actually, I mean, is there any thumb rule, anything on making that call of letting go and anchor? Do you all in your expertise in it have a situation where you say, okay, in this one we should, because it, it could get worse. Yeah. For, for sure. You, you're putting a hook down and then you might have to end up slipping your cable or you might swing around and hit somewhere yeah. else. So I know it is very, yeah, uh, uh, very situation dependent, but that's something which we didn't speak on this because we didn't really yeah. uh, think it's applicable to this. But otherwise, dropping the hook when you have a doubt or to keep the heading or, or yeah. to make prevent it from coming parallel or whatever. Does, has that thought, uh, I mean, do the salvers or do you all give it as a piece of advice or is it a standard thing we do? Or? Yeah. Uh, in the grinding, I don't think we've ever dropped anchor after the incident. Um, no, I think we would have uh, maybe set out an anchor. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to bring in an anchor handler yeah. and to run an anchor out and to have, uh, but you need to tension it, otherwise it doesn't really work. You just drop it, uh, but the plane drop that you run aground. And yeah, but really to drop the ship's anchor. And, and I think there's actually a, a bit of a concern here because uh, let's say uh, you drop your anchor and your, uh, the danger is that you run over your own anchor. And if you do that, you basically uh, definitely a hard object that's underneath the hull and could, could uh, tear it up. How about the other side? You run aground on a tidal boat or on a tide, yeah. and you don't drop anchor, and every low tide you keep getting pushed more into the... No, that's when you sit down or you yeah. bring tucks in. Um, 
I wouldn't drop anchor in that situation. That's where we would advise weigh it down as much as possible, add ballast if you can, until the tug can't yeah. get there. Once the tug is there, hook up, but use your ballast okay. to hold Instead you, of, yeah, to hold you group, to in get location. More. Because sometimes if you drop the anchor, let's say you lose, you get high enough, so you lose seawater suction, you lose your generator, you can't run your hydraulics, you can't recover the anchor, then you have to slip it. But it's good or to think about it, yes. Uh, um, and of course, if you're, let's say, you have a breakdown and you uh, can see that you're going into a shallow or so, uh, then of course uh, you have the presence of mind to... Now if you're drifting, yeah. If you're drifting and you, you pay out an anchor, that's, that's understood. Uh, if you're not still dragging, uh, and it's, it's quite difficult to, uh, to drop your second anchor. Uh, because, well, you will likely get entangled or something, but so normally a cruise won't necessarily, or a master wouldn't do that, but considering uh, the alternative, running aground or having uh, an entangled anchor, it's better to <laughs> have your anchors entangled uh, than, uh, than going aground, I think. So, but uh, we've seen situations where uh, the, the master didn't pay out uh, any anchor run the ground while uh, having a blackout or something and yeah it's, it's difficult to, uh, to, uh, yep. to get them home. Again. So I think to answer your question there is no thumb rule. Thumb rule, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was really the beginning. I mean, there's no thumb rule. You just have to go by. Yeah. Do, it, do it before you ground. If you yeah. do it before you ground, it might help. Once you're aground. Yeah, in this case it, it's, it's not. In this case it's yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, just real quick, scenario two, the salvers convince the owners, convince the authorities, leave the cargo on board, we're going to make a counter ballast support, we put a nice air blowdown system on the uh, starboard tanks. Uh, everyone familiar with what air blowdown means? It's a common salvage technique. So effectively, you got a breach in your bottom of your tank. So you got free flooding that comes in, your vent on top was putting air out. We can come, fit a, just a small little patch with a valve, and you just using compressed air, we create an air pocket in the top of the tank and force the water back out through the bottom of the damage. And then effectively create buoyancy. It's a fairly normal, common salvage technique to gain an air pocket pretty quickly. That's assuming you have enough structural integrity up top that your deck's intact and you don't have additional damage that needs to be patched. Right. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Exxon Valdez or Underground 1889 up in Alaska. She was refloated for a very similar method and then was floated down the entire west coast of the United States on what we call a bubble, which is just basically floating in on an air pocket. So, it's very it's common. never done in, in a tanker industry. We never do this kind of thing. And this is totally opposite. You guys use inert gas, right? You keep maintaining a pressure. Have you ever seen, because of inert gas pressure, there has been a bit of a cargo going down? Ever heard? Never, right? Okay. Here we're talking about putting air inside the tank and pushing the water down. So it's here that actually when we study tank work, they just say increasing IG pressure will help you in your NPSH, NPSH curve. Yes. Theoretically, they say, but fractionally, yeah, fractionally, but practically, I don't think any of us have really experienced that. And other way around, I actually feel by keeping saying the chance of air entering your system are a little more than that's the practical part of it. But uh, theoretically, I mean, we always say NPSH. Is large shares or uh, PV wall, the maximum pressure is 2200 water column, right? It's something yeah, like that. Yeah. PV wall will lift up and things like that, right? But we never talk about like oil being pumped out using that. that but like we're not that actually that. pumping oil out doing this system. This is just to pump the ballast tank. Yes. Yeah, but you've you got a head of the draft here. The pressure when you're pumping is. oil ashore, you've got a head of 20, 40 meters. Yeah. Of course you can't pump 40 meters with a head pressure. You will damage the tanks. But yeah, here yeah. you're just trying to push seven meter head right. at the most. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The, Pressure required, air pressure no, required is very less uh, to maintain this bubble. Uh, air pressure is equal to whatever they double the tank. One. So, yeah, 10 meters. 10 meters. Yeah, one, uh, one, one bar. bar. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, 
And there's anyway no chance of you damaging the other bulkhead because when this tank is full, anyway it's existing the yeah. same amount of pressure on the other bulkhead. So exactly. it's just no structural issues of putting the same amount of pressure. Right. Yes. This this, this makes logical sense. So you'll see salvers use this technique for. But they need only on ballast tanks, not on the, on the fuel tanks, even though they're empty and so on. Most, it's not advisable to do because you might, at a certain point in time, push out uh, as well. And of course, you don't want to do that. Done it on. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's been done. But it's, uh, normally, you try to prevent that from happening if you right. have the choice. As in this example, unfortunately, even with a, the calculated elevation at the ground point, about a half a meter, the vessel still does not come off. The vessel becomes very lively, and the tugs try to work her back and forth, but she never shifts off. She just shifts heading 10 to 15, 30 degrees. This is the potential fear incident that you were discussing about the vessel becoming lively, puncturing further damage. Now you may have an oil release. Not to say that this happened in this case, but that's the consideration that all of you guys have looked at and said we don't even want to risk this. So the assumption is there's a rock pinnacle up inside the hull that's inset far enough that we didn't lift the vessel high enough. The next step in this case was the first step in your guys' plan was to lighter the vessel. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Any questions on that? Was the diver ever had the chance to have a look below? Or it wasn't safe enough for them to dive? In this case? In this case, the diver, no, it was never safe enough for the diver to take a look. Okay. I wonder uh, what I'm saying. It's a uh, vessel move or current or what is unsafe uh, conditions for the divers? Because of the surge around mm -hmm. the underneath? The actually, completely honest, this is a theoretical case. So I'm presuming that it's too rough for the diver, but if the ground is a hard pinnacle and there's enough clearance, then yes, there is room for the diver. If it's a large shelf with a boulder or an impression up, then there uh, would be difficult for the diver to get underneath to inspect. What about the damage? use of an ROV? ROV, diver, if it's the surging, that's the same thing, or there's not enough clearance to get underneath. Your ROV would be the same as the diver could get down to see under the turn of the bilge, but not necessarily underneath to the bottom shelf. So maybe you see the same with both, but you don't necessarily actually see what's holding you up. Uh, but at least to see it from distance, uh, from safe distance, it maybe gives some... Yeah, no, no, of course, yeah. No, no. The same distance, yes, to the turn of the bilge. Let's say the damage is up underneath. Mm -hmm. You can't see it. You just can't physically get to it. The visibility will not be... It's not... No. The visibility will be very restricted under the water. Yeah. Well, I guess. Yes or no? So, if you had damage up inside, uh, away from the side shelf, almost near center line. Then even though you can get an ROV or a diver down here, he can't necessarily see underneath to see where your damage is. You may have clear water visibility, but you can't necessarily get to where the damage is at. So I've been on a few jobs where we had cases like this where the diver was able to swim the side shell and get to this point, turn of the bilge, and one of two things. A, not enough clearance to get down underneath, just actually see where the damage physically is, what's holding the vessel, or B, as the diver gets closer to this point, there's a little bit of a clearance underneath, and you get a strong surge back and forth with the water that would suck them in. Now, yes, you can put an ROV down there. Possibility ROV gets sucked in, you see a picture, it gets blown back out, you see something. Most likely it gets sucked in, gets caught on this piece of jagged steel, cuts the umbilical, you lose the ROV. But this is a possibility. Now the other possibility is the damage is all right here on the side, and you come down and you can see everything. Don't really know. For this case, I'm assuming it's somewhere inside where you really can't see it. 
for assuming double bottom height is two meters, we only came up half a meter. So that leaves a one and a half meter possibility that we're still holding. Now this could be less than a meter, it could be three quarters of a meter, we really don't know. All we know is this ballast tank is breached, but our cargo tank is not breached. But we could also have plate buckling up through here and just deflections, but not actual breach. So there's several unknowns. I think another limitation for divers or our fees for that matter. Of course, you have your tight uh, uh, schedule and uh, tidal range. So the moment that you're going uh, over uh, one knot of, of current, then the diver is only looking uh, to hold on uh, uh, to something, and not trying to be washed away. So there's only a, a slack tight arrangement uh, where you uh, can do something, and that's sometimes very limited. And sometimes, like there's like a different type of tidal range or double tight, where you really have to wait quite a long time before you can actually send a diver down, uh, or, or if there's uh, like a conversion of, of different uh, current patterns here in Singapore due to the dredging and reclamation areas and so on. There are a lot of uh, eddies and, and other uh, kind of uh, currents that uh, doesn't allow you to, uh, to go and, uh, and swim uh, with divers. So, and then you, but what you know, of course, if there's damage and it's been uh, fairly uh, rapid, uh, quite an impact that we all can assume. Um, so, you, well, you know that there's damage, now, now what are you going to do, are you going to patch it or, uh, so then I think you need to take the next step, we know it's flooded, so we forget about the tank and then move on, it's then seeing if, let's say, adjacent tanks and, 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 and cargo holds and so are, are increasing, so monitor those, that uh, if it's in the vicinity of those tanks that they are damaged or will be damaged, uh, those are concerns because then you're uh, escalating the situation a little bit further. Okay. Yeah. Cody, what about the peak tanks, four peak and half peak tanks? Can we play around with that as well or not? Trim it further by head or by Can. Can. Because if the ship is lively, that means it's trying to get up. You know? So by doing it the other way, it's the possibility of pulling it up. In this condition, the after peak is already full. The original condition is after peak already 100% full. Mm -hmm. She's already, after damage, she has gone down by head, so we have no, nothing else. All other cargo tanks are 100% full. Because your ground point is midships yeah. with it on the starboard side, your aft peak tank and fore peak tank are more center line, so they're not going to necessarily have a large effect in rolling port to starboard. In um, terms of being able to trim, since you're ground point is near midships, it's going to have little effect. What you could look at doing would be maybe making sure the fore peak and aft peak tank were empty to try to get as much buoyancy as possible, but your fore peak tank is already empty and your aft peak tank, the full were about 60%, okay, isn't going to make a very large consideration in this case. But yes, it is something we could certainly look at and take a look at that to see if that would have an effect. Yeah. I think uh, this morning uh, we have been uh, addressing some of these uh, aspects already, uh, so maybe we can go over them. Uh, a little bit uh, faster, uh, key stakeholders uh, that are involved. Uh, this is of course you want to prevent, but uh, <laughs> um, there will be a lot of uh, parties involved that, that do have an opinion about it, uh, about uh, and experiences and so on, but ultimately you have to bring it down to the, uh, the, the facts of uh, what is there and find uh, the, the, the critical path out of it. Um, but there will be a lot of distractions uh, along the way. Um, just a, a, a selection of uh, 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 
support uh, operation and it into about 12 million dollars in, 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 uh, in services to get, keep a status quo throughout that operation. So we know uh, we can identify in, uh, on your uh, notes, you, you identify those uh, parties that are getting involved. And yeah, what, what would those uh, respective parties uh, expect? And we had this uh, small discussion about uh, other machinery, PNI. Um, uh, how they uh, behave themselves. And, and yeah, it's really dependent on where an incident takes place, which parties are involved, which hull uh, machinery uh, we are talking about, which uh, brokers that are getting involved, correspondents, consultants that are appointed, cargo interests that have an active or uh, passive role in this, uh, this case. And then when uh, solvers uh, get involved, are there any other uh, contractors or contractors for the solvers, but also um, uh, is there an uh, uh, SCR engaged? This SCR stands for uh, Special uh, Casualty Representative. Normally they get involved when it's a salvage contract, like a Lloyd's Hopper form uh, or similar, and uh, when the uh, uh, scopic clause, the, so basically a safety net clause for salvage uh, contracts uh, has been invoked. Uh, the, the consultant will work with all the owner's interest, uh, the property groups uh, and the P&I uh, to work alongside the, the salvage company to find uh, and optimize the solution, but also monitor uh, that the solver is doing what he's su supposed to do, uh, but also allow access to, uh, to information. Um, even though uh, emergency responder has been engaged in dealing with an uh, uh, incident, it's not that uh, they take over the, the project. We get to contracts a, a little bit later, but um, sometimes uh, we see in a situation where there's an incident, uh, it's a difficult situation, uh, out of the comfort zone of the, um, the, the, the ship owner, and um, the conclusion has been reached that uh, an emergency responder, a solver, has been engaged, and they basically surrender and say, okay, now do your, uh, do your worst. <laughs> yeah? And uh, basically um, allow uh, the entire situation to be controlled by uh, the emergency responder. Now, this is uh, not the right way. Uh, what I mentioned earlier this morning, the crew on board knows the vessel uh, best. And you know your vessel better than uh, any salvage company in the world. So if we need to know anything uh, about the vessel and how you deal with uh, certain logistics uh, even, or approach certain uh, stakeholders in uh, this incident, involved in this incident, you will have those contacts. So you need to stand next to each other, say, well, okay, how do we deal with this? Um, in, in the most optimum way. And uh, I, th I think that's, that's very important. So there, there needs to remain uh, engagement uh, between owners, interest group, uh, and uh, the contractor, what the solver is. Um, and I think that's also sometimes, uh, so the SCR will make sure that uh, an owner, interest property owners, uh, will um, meet their obligations under the contract as well. Um, if uh, there is information or there is support required, for instance, uh, a guarantee uh, that the Port Authority requires to allow the vessel in. Uh, port Authority wants to be uh, comfortable that if a situation escalates, that they are ensured that the port will be cleared uh, and that business uh, can continue as usual, uh, even though this incident is happening in the port or the, uh, the economic zone of a country. So, uh, if the PI club is not forthcoming with uh, putting up a guarantee, uh, then um, that might uh, significantly delay uh, the, uh, 
uh, the solvers operation, or the permissions might not be granted to uh, render any activities in that area. Uh, I've been involved with a case in Australia, a uh, vessel ground on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, normal uh, p &I guarantee that need to be put up by a correspondent, maybe $10 million here in Singapore. Um, over there, in that particular case, we say, well, 50 million comes first, and that's immediately outside of uh, the comfort zone of the PI club. But if they don't comply, nothing will, uh, will move. So uh, there is then a bit of frantic discussions between the authorities, the correspondents, and the PI clubs. And then uh, ultimately, there will be some kind of arrangement where, where that uh, will, will be put in place. In, in the United States, I think there's uh, an uh, unlimited uh, uh, exposure, basically. Um, but for that reason, basically, the OPA 90 SMFF arrangement uh, provides uh, arrangements to deal with these contracts and the financing and the guarantees that are required. So to that extent, the system is, is, uh, is working very well. It's not that uh, the PNI clubs like it very much to be exposed uh, in a jurisdiction like the United States. Um, uh, but uh, the, the uh, mandatory requirements in, in the United States have uh, dictated basically that this beforehand, before anything happens, that's in place. And those kind of uh, funding agreements, uh, 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 which you have with the QI with ourselves, uh, have been vetted by the PI clubs uh, beforehand and are all in place. Cargo insurers, similar. They. Uh, this is of course, um, and you have to see it in line of. Uh, they are part of the venture of bringing uh, the ship and the cargo from A to B. So they have an obligation as well. They signed uh, the, the the shipping papers, and by doing so, they agree to the terms, uh, whatever are stated in those uh, trend. Uh, the, uh, the shipment com uh, conditions. So, um, if something happens um, to the vessel, they are part of the arrangement. So, if the, there's a GA declared or there's a uh, salvage uh, agreed, a uh, salvage contract signed, the owner uh, ship will bind cargo, freight, um, charters with. Uh, and, and cargo interest with uh, with the terms that are agreed at that point in time. So uh, cargo then will have an active role to participate. And um, cargo knows what what uh, yeah, there could be cargo contamination uh, due to water ingress. There could be uh, specific uh, handling dealing with 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 the cargoes, temperatures. Uh, storage uh, arrangements, uh, cleanliness of uh, receiving tankers. Uh, there are a lot of uh, things that, uh, that uh, could be uh, considered here and uh, should be considered here, but again, um, uh, cargo, um, cargo interest and their insurance uh, have to step up and be part of it to, um, to uh, make sure that everybody's on board and knows how to deal with these, uh, these kind of conditions. For a solvent contract, uh, there, there will be uh, a proportionality. So, uh, with if, if uh, let's say the 50% of, of uh, the value in ship and cargo uh, is cargo, then they will ultimately have to pay up uh, or contribute 50% to the overall bill. Um, but normally, there are a bit more st stakeholders. It's not normally uh, only one parcel. It might be several parcels, uh, there might be freight uh, charges, there might be um, uh, chartering arrangements for the bunkers the, the, and, the, and the hull uh, itself as well. Um, yeah, there, there are many things to consider. I think, uh, I think we would be a little bit pressed for time if, if we would go into uh, it in, in many details, too many details. If you have any questions about it, please uh, please raise them. But uh, what I would like to stress is that all these stakeholders have an important uh, role to play and, and sometimes are pivotal in uh, a solvent situation. 
Uh, if one party is unwilling to, uh, to participate or has a certain requirement uh, in, in the scheme of things, or uh, even though uh, we as a solver might want to handle the cargo, we never become the owner of the cargo. We want to deal with the ship in a certain way, but we will not uh, become uh, the owner uh, of, of, of the vessel, of course. So we always have to, uh, we cannot freely do whatever we want to do. And again, it depends on the type of contracts that has been agreed on, to what kind of flexibility we would have and how we would cooperate. Uh, if it's a time and material basis, basically we, we would look to you, say, well, give us some direction, what do you want to do? Give me a scope of work, uh, then I will put my resources in it, and then we'll run from there. Uh, if, if you say, well, uh, deal with it on, an, uh, on a salvage contract, and then there are some payment terms that are different, which is uh, a bit open-ended, but it also allows flexibility, then still we would go back to you, of course, and say, well, we intend to do this for this and this reason. Would you agree? And if there are concerns at that point in time, uh, um, and you cannot make a decision, we will make a decision because we will take our responsibility to save the, the property, but uh, we will take note uh, if it's in a certain direction. So, I think there is a Kai Jun case quite uh, topical there, you know, that there was an issue between now ship owners, HNL and PNI Club, who is to take the responsibility of removing this uh, rep. Yeah, this is current. This is yeah. a current case. Yeah. yeah, it's going on. So, a lot depends because everybody wants to push things away from that. The HNL is it's not my problem. It's yeah, my problem. just maybe to, to explain uh, the yeah. case a little bit uh, more. This is a, a dredge vessel or an aggregate uh, carrier. It sank uh, near Horsburg, about seven miles of Horsburg. And um, uh, in this particular case, the uh, uh, insured value uh, of the vessel uh, was about $30 million. But the market value may be uh, only 10. And, and she's completely sunk. <laughs> um, now, the, the Chinese uh, underwriters, the whole machinery, they say, well, uh, I don't want to part with my $30 million, uh, so I don't want to declare it a total loss. Uh, if they would declare a total loss, basically they pay to the owners uh, $30 million, and then uh, the P&I will come in to do a wreck removal. So if they say, well, uh, if a salvage company can remove the vet or raise the vessel for about $10 million and I will fit it out for another $10 million, I'm still uh, making uh, eh, less of a loss than I would do if I uh, pay out my uh, complete uh, total loss uh, funds. And, and where it probably goes uh, uh, towards is that this decision is now one and a half months ago that this yeah. incident happened. Still pending. Still pending. So more and more uh, of, of potential recovery possibility will be uh, removed because uh, everything will be um, destroyed. filled with yeah, destroyed. With, uh, fishes will uh, <laughs> uh, going through every part of the vessel. It will uh, you, you get marine growth on everything. So it will become more and more expensive and difficult, or frankly impossible, to, uh, to recover anything and refit it. So uh, they will, at a certain point in time, we believe, uh, wake up and say, well, okay, uh, enough of this. It is a total loss, and unfortunately, we need to part with our uh, uh, monies and give that to the owners, and then the P&I club will step in and say, well, okay, now we want to remove, or we need to remove the wreck. So sometimes uh, in, in, a, in a kind of a, a different situation where you can make a recovery, uh, these aspects, these forces between the underwriter and the PNI um, are quite, uh, quite uh, prevalent as well. And if you're dealing with, uh, with a salvage or a wreck removal, uh, your uh, involvement, also your involvement, will, will be completely changed. Uh, if, uh, let's say you have a vessel without any cargo, uh, limited bunkers. The moment the bunkers are off and it, it's a total loss, basically it's end of story for, your, for, for yourselves. Uh, it will be, uh, basically control will be taken over by the P&I club. 
the, the reputational thing uh, is still there, you're still involved, but on a day-to-day -day basis, basically, you probably step back because the vessel will not be recovered anymore, and it's uh, to that extent the end of the story. And there is one more issue here, is a uh, lot of time you are actually looking at the H&M as to what are they going to be doing, because at the end, they will pay for it, right? So should they take the lead, or you take the lead? You are the ship owners, your ship, grounded, damaged, and repairs have to be done. HNM will always send one senior consultant to look after their interest, basically, what needs to be done, right? At their time, they say, all right, let's try and get it done, some cheap and sweet repair, and uh, let's move the ship away. Whereas you want the ship to be done, probably proper repairs, yep. right, more robust done by the people who you can rely on. And uh, for example, I mean, we had this uh, ship in uh, Chile, and there were local salvage who said they will do it for maybe one-tenth the cost we were proposing. But the ship owner said, no, you got to do it. And so why are you using us, right? You know, why don't you just use them? Because the reliability factor and the fact that these guys were not really qualified welders and yeah. people who could do the job. So a lot of guys come with a lot of promises except they don't have the depth of experience or the history behind them to be able to deliver. And you may end up actually paying a lot more. Yeah. But definitely, of course, in an incident like that, uh, Hill Machinery, uh, again, uh, an organization like Guard, I think very proactive, very professional. Uh, they uh, they will, will get in there and, and uh, stand next to you as well. Um, but it, it depends a little bit how remote it is, how accessible it is to them. Um, but normally they will uh, err on the side of safety, so they, they will uh, sway a long way. Uh, uh, yeah, if there is like a clear uh, exposure to them or the environment, uh, collision, uh, cargo has been affected, you see that they uh, come to the fore uh, fairly quickly. Um, the situation is already escalated to a certain extent. Um, and in that uh, case, they, uh, they will also contribute, or they need to have to put up securities and so on, so they will get involved. Um, still, uh, if it's possible to recover, it's a salvage emergency response to that extent. They, of course, try to uh, put that to the uh, underwriters and, and try to minimize their exposure. Uh, it's almost like a, a normal organization. Uh, they don't want to pay for something that they should not pay for. And, and sometimes that is uh, quite, uh, quite difficult. If you look at the cargo uh, underwriters, they will, uh, in the cargo interest, they will say, well, you run my cargo aground. Uh, so uh, it, it's not really that simple, of course, but uh, I've been involved with cases where cargo industry say, well, I had nothing to do with uh, this uh, particular grounding. Uh, uh, th this, uh, this, this vessel uh, basically ran my cargo around. I don't know why I should contribute. Uh, well, actually you signed <laughs> on the shipping papers and by doing so, you agree to the terms of, of, uh, uh, of, of shipment. And that also means that if something goes wrong, that you're uh, responsible for contributing to um, to, to the salvage or uh, GA or whatever it may be. b &I correspondence, even uh, Guard now has of course also an office here in Singapore, uh, in Hong Kong, Japan, uh, all over the place, but still they would, from an operational perspective, go to, I think, Spica, normally here in Singapore, or Asia in general. Um, and get uh, correspondence involved that uh, sometimes can be a little bit of a buffer or know the authorities very well, so that uh, they have uh, the specific knowledge of the, uh, uh, the lay of the land and know how to behave and, and proactively do certain things. And also uh, be able to advise, okay, this is uh, a bit more significant uh, kind of situation now, you need to have third parties, uh, uh, emergency responders uh, engaged, otherwise uh, you might be uh, uh, finding yourself in a difficult situation.
will uh, for, for maybe minor uh, incidents uh, uh, can liaise with the master to make sure that all formalities are, are being uh, used uh, or gone, gone through um, reporting to authorities and stuff like that um, so this is a, a very important part that we see and normally if we hear of something happening we more or less know which correspondent uh, is uh, representing uh, which, which P&I club um, and we will approach them to see how we can assist or if we, we can assist or if it's necessary to assist. Authorities, well, I think a lot have been said about authorities. Um, I think the most uh, important part, and I cannot stress it uh, uh, enough actually, is that they are basically not there to, to help. Uh, I think they need to be confident that any operations will be done in accordance to uh, the, the, the rules and regulations, of course, but priority is security, safety, and environment. Of course, uh, uh, safety and, and security for the personnel in that port or that country. Um, and, and that needs to be uh, safeguarded. Anything else, uh, uh, of course, they will uh, then evaluate. I think um, like Singapore is quite a commercial port. Um, they're quite happy to help uh, ship owners uh, in general, uh, but you of course need to take care of these security safety aspects first. So if that has been taken care of and, and uh, a risk assessment has been taken, made, which uh, shows uh, that, that that situation is under control and what contingencies are in place to safeguard this, any additional requirements they are happy to, uh, to discuss, uh, in our opinion, uh, the, the experience that we have. But they want to see that uh, the moment that, uh, let's say, a damaged vessel will be brought, let's say from this, uh, this incident, it will be brought into Singapore, uh, why should Singapore accept it? It's outside of their jurisdiction, basically. Uh, if they bring it in, we don't know exactly what's happening underneath this vessel. Is it safe? Will she leak into uh, any cargo or bunkers into Singapore? Uh, these are questions that they, they will, will ask and they want to have a, a solid answer to this. And Solvor is not always the right party to do this. Um, over time we have done a lot of dealings with the MPA, uh, so we build up quite a bit of goodwill and trust and of course that's a good uh, basis of working together. But we're still a contractor for you, uh, uh, the owners. Um, and by default, we are then biased. We will also say, yeah, it will be fine. Um, but they want to have a bit more reassurance uh, than that. So they normally say, well, okay, do you have an independent uh, consultant or so? That can also uh, verify that that's the case. And um, uh, even them, then they say, well, um, we want from your classification uh, society uh, confirmation that everything is, is fine. And this, uh, I find this always a little bit odd because the classification society says, well, if you have a, a breach in a the tank, they say, well, you're out of class, basically. Uh, or your class is suspended uh, until that uh, time that you have repaired it. So if, as a solver, we make a damage uh, stability calculation, strength calculations, you say, well, we have this, uh, this kind of arrangement, so the vessel will not break in two, uh, she will not uh, breach any, 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 uh, any compartments uh, because uh, of, of the condition that is, uh, she is in. Um, they basically only can verify if our methodology of calculating is sound. So they look at it and they say, well, yeah, that is fine, but they will not normally uh, evaluate if the data that we put in there uh, to calculate with is accurate. Um, so it's still um, a, a bit of a question mark, uh, basically, if authorities, but it gives, of course, the authorities the, uh, some kind of uh, independent uh, um, reference uh, point that uh, what we have been saying is correct. And of course, if you have have received that from several sources like a consultant, classification, solver itself and the owners, 
uh, then I, I guess they, uh, together they will also assess, of course with their marine department, um, to see if, if that's indeed uh, a realistic uh, uh, situation and, and then allow or, or, or reject basically the vessel. If they reject it, they will say, well, at the moment we are not allowing you, uh, you in for this and this reason, so then you can say, well, I can choose maybe another location or I will step up my contingencies uh, to deal with it, uh, which is possible as well. I think with respect to authorities that was involved in one case, uh, a, a tanker that ran into uh, a an, an, an sunken uh, car carrier in the English Channel. And this was, um, and that's related to the uh, uh, political actually, political uh, situation uh, in, in certain countries. Um, this vessel uh, was damaged. Um, we were involved in uh, supporting it and we asked for permission to the Belgium authorities, uh, this was the English Channel, Belgium authorities to allow the vessel in even though she was in damaged condition and then go inside, uh, either transfer to a terminal or SDS in a, in a sheltered area. Uh, but at the time the elections were taking place um, and um, uh, I think it was like a, a left uh, green party. Uh, they were arguing a point that this thing should never be allowed, and uh, yeah, there was no spillage uh, at that point in time. But um, they were just uh, completely uh, against uh, providing any support to this thing. So, from the English Channel, we spoke with uh, uh, the, the Dutch authorities, and we were allowed to get the vessel inside of Rotterdam port. But uh, yeah, there would be much more exposure to uh, the transit uh, in a way the tanker from the English Channel to Rotterdam whereas we could have basically hopped in uh, into uh, the port of Belgium uh, in Antwerp uh, fairly quickly and but purely because of the mindset at that point in time during the elections and and so on they just uh, categorically said no we will not accept it yeah but I think this is the case with the prestige as well but yeah, she was not allowed uh, for repairs in the Spanish uh, yeah, shipyard, correct. and she 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 sank up there. Correct. Uh, in the Prestige, uh, they they basically sent her out uh, at high seas. Uh, they've done that on uh, several occasions. Uh, the Spanish authorities, I think, uh, and the Portuguese authorities, um, and and basically, uh, they, they they weighed up in my. Uh, being wrongly, of course, the, the consequences. The, the moment that the they sent the prestige out, uh, basically she broke in two, she spilled a lot of oil, and basically uh, damaged the coastal areas in Spain, Portugal, and France. Uh, whereas if they would have allowed her to come in close, she might have survived, one. If she would have spilled, it would have been at a, at a smaller area, and it would have been contained. But those are difficult decisions to make, uh, indeed. Uh, there was the Castor also uh, there, uh, this case in the English Channel was the Vicky. Um, yeah, so there, there are, it is always very sensitive and also uh, recently uh, we've been talking about container ships a little bit. Uh, um, that has happened as well and they've been vessels being sent away um, from, from the UK. Uh, the SOSREP, they have like the uh, Secretary of State representative, they say well, no, I don't think you meet all the qualifications to allow this vessel uh, into uh, a UK port because it will give exposure to, uh, it's not safe for our uh, commu local communities or so. And that vessel, they had to prepare further and then they were allowed, uh, as a German owner at least, to go into Bremer or Harbor, I think. Uh, but you can see, well, uh, the, of course the authorities are in the right to do whatever they want. Uh, but to go from offshore in the Atlantic, I think, to go all the way to Bremer, um, there's a longer distance in my, uh, uh, well, basically a basic assessment, and uh, more things could happen, of course. But you're holding onto a wreck and, or an, 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 a damaged vessel for a longer period of time, and you have 
potentially more exposure, even along the UK and British coast. So sometimes it's a little bit uh, difficult to understand how these decisions are being made. Uh, but what is very important is to present something to authorities uh, which is well thought through and uh, in my opinion you should not allow authorities to think too much uh, because there will be too many departments that will fall over each other to think of all things that could go wrong and they want to, uh, to have contingencies for. But if you present something which is basically a solid plan uh, with uh, sufficient contingency, realistic contingencies, um, then it's okay. But those contingencies of course cost money. So we need to basically, before you present it to an authority as a concerted effort with all the uh, stakeholders, say well, we need to have one or two tucks more uh, than we actually think is necessary, just to, uh, uh, if that is one of the uh, contingencies that they, we envisage uh, them to, to, to want in, in place. Uh, so we need to have that in place, and that will be a, a, a costly factor, can be a costly factor. Class, I'm not sure what I do. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? No, normally they say, well, hey, not in class. Me and James say, Waller from class. <laughs> <laughs> Jobs <laughs> about peace. <laughs> yeah, about yeah. peace. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said it for a reason. Uh, but I think the um, ERS services, um, uh, and we, uh, as we saw, provide uh, damage stability uh, assessments. That's an aspect that is actually a bit separate from the other uh, class uh, elements. And of course, um, in the aftermath, uh, uh, and, and, and to, to uh, as a kind of independent uh, uh, party uh, to it, uh, they will give some uh, some support uh, to the credibility of, of certain plans, and uh, to, uh, to to give some assurance uh, to the authorities and so on and parties involved that. Uh, the, the right steps are being followed and, and that the, the condition in general is, is okay with the vessel, only in this particular we need to focus on, on certain elements. I think the most important role is they represent flags. So, mm. so for example, if you try to do anything, the flag will say go to class yeah. because class is their representative. And yeah. If we get the, the, the flag, whether it's Hong Kong or Marshall Islands or whatever, he's yeah. going to be involved in this. So yeah. That's probably the biggest role is they represent the flag state. Okay, so so, but from a flag state perspective, how do they uh, uh, get involved basically in an emergency response situation? Uh, well, uh, I can give you an example. We had the ship damaged in Bahamas, and we wanted to shift it to the uh, to the Middle East for repairs. Yeah. Then we need we need flag to agree that we can sail that ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out yeah. of the, the jurisdiction into another jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So, so I think class will, and it will also affect their insurance coverage. Uh, no, 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 that I insurance. understand. Yeah. Look, I've got a great hole in the bottom, and I'm about to take it across the Atlantic yeah. Ocean. And I think that's the best idea. It's much cheaper to repair on the other side. The insurer, they will say, "Hang on, are we facing uh, greater losses through this or, or lesser losses?" So, so that's where class comes in very much. No, that, that, that I, uh, and yeah. actually having insurance cover for whatever mm. you've done. You no, 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 I, I, I uh, was... Uh, you're going to move it somewhere else. Sure, sure, sure. But they'll say, well, we could have repaired it uh, where yeah. it was for this much, but, you know, it should be moved. So I think that's yeah. always been uh, Yes. I, well, I, I do understand that point, uh, but the... Uh, so the uh, classification as to vetting, uh, the, uh, even the damaged uh, condition of the vessel, uh, flag state and so on, uh, with, with uh, certain exposure that they have uh, as to the insurance and so on. But um, if they are not comfortable uh, with uh, the outcome of the assessments that are, are, are made, um, you've got a big, uh, big hole in the vessel indeed and you need to make a passage uh, somewhere uh, how are you going to do that? Uh, um, class will just categorically say also, no, 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 this needs to be solved. And it can be in a very remote location. 
Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll give you an example of, of a situation that has been involved in the grounding of uh, Ecuador. Uh, an an, an uh, bulker uh, laden with uh, iron ore. And uh, she had significant damage. Bottom uh, uh, 80% gone. Um, so part light ring, we floating, and there she was in uh, uh, quite an exposed location. So the only uh, possibility in that case was basically bring her to China, uh, light her further, um, and, um, uh, and repair her. Um, now we um, uh, tried together with the owners to convince class uh, to, uh, to accept the vessel, uh, to be towed to, uh, to China. Class said, no, that is, uh, we cannot uh, accept to that. As a solver on, on our salvage contract in that particular case, uh, we can say, well, uh, we believe that we can control this. So we uh, say, well, we are uh, happy with these contingency in place, uh, air pumping requirements, uh, sufficient uh, towing uh, capability um, to tow her to uh, to destination and then uh, deal with it 